use. Um, but this is kind of our guiding document when we're looking at um, is there enough loading on um, a commercial corridor, um, prioritizing things like bus service and passenger pickup drop off. Um, so the way this overlaps with shared spaces is that um, during earlier in the pandemic when loading and, and vehicle traffic was less, less frequent, um, we were permitting um, temporary permits for parklets and loading zones. And so now as we're moving towards a permanent program, we've proactively contacted people in loading zones to let them know. Um, what we're trying to do so that you can keep your parklet is relocate those loading zones. Um, but that's a legislative process that has to go through a public hearing, and so it can add time to your um, application. So if you are in a loading zone, note that um, green zones, passenger pickup and drop off the white zones, those are um, sometimes we don't need to replace them as much. Um, and then also earlier on, I, I don't think we have any left, but if you're in a bus stop you need, and the bus has come back, you need to no longer be in the bus stop. And also the blue zones for um, accessible parking, um, that's something else, else that we don't allow parklets in. Um, another thing that the SMTA reviews for is the visibility at intersections. So um, on the far side of the intersection, if you're driving, that's when you exit the intersection, we require eight feet of setback. And so that's so you can see, um, pedestrians and drivers can see one another. Um, and then on the near side, when you're approaching the intersection of the driver, we were asking for 20 feet, so about one parking space. Um, and again, that's to allow for visibility to um, improve safety. Um, that's another thing that we've been reaching out to businesses um, and parcel operators about to let them know. And in, in many cases, if it's not already red, we'll be painting those um, corners red um, so that people don't park in them. And the daylight is called daylighting. This was something that was underway um, pre-pandemic and um, the parklets are really large structures, even larger than in most cars, so that's why we have these um, requirements. Um, the other thing we look at is just the overall footprint, and so there's a two space maximum. Um, if you feel like there's a case to be made why you may need more spaces, you have really large frontage, um, let me know, or let the SMTA know. We kind of review them case by case. Um, but this also shows the setbacks. I think um, fire department will go into more detail, but when I look at a site plan, I look to make sure what's the overall size, are there the three foot setbacks on each end, um, and if it's longer than 20 um, linear feet of curb, is there a three foot gap in, in the middle? Um, also note if you're on a meter, Street or, or one with like painted markings, or usually the T or for diagonal or angle, there's um, striped lines. You want to keep your parklet and the setback within those lines. The one exception is if there's a, a non active red zone, so there's no fire hydrant, there's no bus, you can overlap with that three feet. Again, if you have questions, you can let me know. But, um, and the, we, we needed to stay within the lines of the parking space so that the other spaces on that block are usable. Um, if you're overlapping into it, um, then you have a much smaller space that another car can't use or a loading zone can't use. Um, and then um, to designate that like three foot gap that is needed for emergency access, um, you need the two soft tip posts shown here and then uh, a wheel stop. And then when you get your, your final um, permit approved and issued, um, it also comes with the signs that you need to post on your um, parklet. Um, you also need to have uh, visibility striping you can see on this parklet corner um, so that the parklet's visible at night. Again, they're, they're larger than most parked cars and so that's why they need, um, they need that. Um, also, just to say on the last slide, um, for parallel parking spaces, um, they can only be seven feet max. Um, width into the street, even if the parking space is bigger. And for angled and perpendicular, it's 14 feet max, again, even if the space is, is deeper. Um, so I'm, I'm also looking, does it fit within that, those maximum and minimums? Um, and when you're placing the gaps, especially the middle gap, make sure it's, it's 
or they all need to be clear, um, but make sure the middle one you have more flexibility with. So, you know, but move it over a foot if there's a tree or something like that. Um, and here you see kind of the setbacks in action, where we need, need that space, um, and how, you know, you, nobody can get through, you can't get a gurney through in the community. Okay, and I'll pass it over to Public Works for ADA. Question? Mm -hmm. On the final parking, I thought it was 20 feet, the maximum. I see you have 40 feet. Uh, yeah, if you have two parking spaces. So can be 40 feet contained? With no, the you three need feet. The 20, or the three feet gap in the middle. So the background did not have the three feet right. in the middle. Right. This, this one in there, uh, the left one. The left one here? Looks yeah. like it's 40 feet. Yeah, it should have a three foot. In the ah, okay. yeah. Okay, good morning. Thanks for making time for us this morning and coming out. I know for folks it's a very inconvenience, so if it was hard for you, we appreciate it. Um, I'm going to be talking about just some fundamentals for public work review and for our rules and regs. Um, before I get going, just for your own like context, rules and regs that we have for this program that relate to access, most of them are not new, which is to say that they were from our pre-existing cafe tables and chairs program, which has been around since the 90s, or our pre-existing parklet program, which is like a decade old or so. So most of these things are, are pursuant to some other pre-existing code rule or reg. There's very little that we came up uniquely with from a design perspective. So uh, just some basic do's and don'ts. Uh, clear path of travel on sidewalks with diverter. <coughs> um, one thing when we're reviewing cafe tables and chairs plans, um, sometimes folks, businesses, they'll like want to measure to the last centimeter of available foot, square footage. When our team reviews these, one of the things they'll look at is if there's a radius for chairs to go in and out. Because realistically, someone like myself sits down to eat at your, your dinner and I'm not going to be able to pull flush against the table. Um, so they'll basically review your path of travel, any site plans that are submitted, that's going to be one of the first things that our team looks for. Is there a defined path of travel and is it wide enough? Um, this is not going to be, this is going to provide varying levels of challenge for some folks. If you're on a narrow sidewalk, you have less uh, of an envelope to work with. If you're on an exceedingly wide sidewalk, you're going to be able to get more seating. It won't be one size fits all. Um, then we're going to look for that three foot access gap that we just mentioned. In uh, the last slide, as you can see, that goes up to the air. This maybe is not the best textbook example because there are some trees that are in that gap. And the purpose for that gap is so that folks can get in and out with stretchers or that they can ladder that building in a, in a rescue situation. Um, at the onset of our programming, Annie mentioned that there's some PSAs. There's one on fire, and you see the, the folks going in and out of there. It's a lot more apparent why that's uh, necessary. Visibility about 42 inches. Um, we get a lot of questions about this because folks are essentially trying to build a dining room outdoors as opposed to an open air deck. And that 42 inches of visibility means that you're not going to have, you know, like a, an enclosed structure. The reason being, if it's not evident, is so that first responders, when they pull up, can easily identify entry to buildings and structures and identify that address. And that. That's the height of the walls. Yeah, and I was just going to say they're going to measure that from the interior of the structure. Um, going on, street address on display, pretty easy one, but again, that's required so that buyers not doing laps around your block. Equivalent and accessible facility. This is one we've got questions on. You need to have an equivalent facility and an ADA facility. If you have a parklet, it needs to be in the parklet. If you have cafe tables and chairs, i.e. sidewalk seating, it needs to be there. It needs to be in each. You can't supplement one with the other or say, hey, uh, I don't have an accessible parklet, but I have an accessible table six feet away. It needs to be in the parklet and it needs to be on the sidewalk. That's a codified requirement and that was part of the deliberation for this program before we had a lot, huge amount of um, complaints regarding accessibility in the public right of way related to this program. And when we investigate that, we find a lot of those complaints are credible. So that's one reason why that requirement was, was placed on the program. Um, reflective materials on corners, again, pretty easy one. They're just trying to prevent a car hitting it. Um, clearance for firefighting ladders. This is this one, um, you, 
you may notice some parklets are able to have a roof and that's dependent on sidewalk width. And the reason why is it's basically are we going to put the ladder on the sidewalk or are we going to put the ladder outside of the parklet? And so the slope and how they can ladder that, if the roof is there, they can't ladder it from outside of the parklet. And if the sidewalk's that narrow, they can't place the, the ladder on the sidewalk. So there's reasons why um, that restriction on roofs is there. And, and that's, this deals with it a little bit, but there are other conditions, for example, that three foot vertical gap. If you have a crossbar over there, they can't ladder it, even though if they can walk through it. Um, space heaters, clear flammable materials. Um, so essentially, you can't put an LPG or a gas heater within that parklet if you have a roof on it. And then setbacks from crosswalks. Um, you may hear the MTA team talk about daylighting. I'll be candid, if you're, if you're at a direct intersection, you're drawing a short straw in so much as they need more real estate to do daylighting so that when folks pull up to said intersection, there's visibility to prevent accidents. So general accessibility, this is just an overview, a mock-up they did of a city block that tries to demonstrate um, the accessible features that we're looking for. Some of them were in that PSA that you saw at the beginning of our programming, the diverters, so that if somebody has a visual impairment, they're able to. We have to keep turning radiuses at intersections. So even, you know, I've talked about intersections sometimes being a short straw. You're about a busy intersection and there's a bus stop there and we need the turning radius for accessibility for folks that aren't even dying there to get up and on and around the sidewalk. It's definitely um, gonna shrink the envelope that we're gonna allow occupancy on. Um, path of travel, continuous. So it shouldn't be a hopscotch match to get through that sidewalk. There should be some intuitive path through. <clears throat> Our team, these are the things that they're gonna be reviewing when they ask for plans. So for cafe tables and chairs, we look at where things are placed to ensure that that path of travel is continuous. For parklets, because they're in um, the, the curb, we don't need to see the path of travel as much, but when we go out there to do our site assessment and do the final inspection, they're gonna ensure that there's ADA compliant seating there. So we just have a couple Gukas and Gallon slides, and one of them you can see, this is a very crowded sidewalk. Be very challenging um, for folks to get through here. Now that's with all the diners kind of sitting in an orderly manner. If we have two or three tables that flip over at any given point in time, you're not going to be able to get through there at all. Six foot path of travel, again, uh, proximity to the curb, not a very safe practice. And you can see there's some street furniture as well. So it's, it's not continuous. I'd have to essentially zigzag in and out. Not picking on anyone with these photos, too. We just kind of rock with what we got complaint wise. Here's a good one. Uh, you can see a pretty good path of travel. It's clear, it's contiguous, but we don't see any diverters. So that would be really easy if I had a visual impairment and I was working with a cane for me to walk on top of one of your diners. Yeah, this is just a notion that um, accessibility is not meant to be, it can be a challenge for folks when they have their eye on a set amount of like two top that they think they need to get, but actually promoting accessibility, diverters are a pretty inexpensive feature to add to a site plan. And um, developing a path of travel is essentially you have a, a ruler and you're able to define that simple path. What we're getting at is we're not, we don't have an expectation that accessibility is tantamount to cost of improvements. It's more or less utilizing what's in front of us to promote accessibility. Um, we mentioned accessibility in these parklets, and this is accessible. One thing I touched on earlier, you can't, you can't have one supplement the other, so you need to have accessible sidewalks and seating and uh, light facilities in a parklet as well. That, in the, in the pandemic program, we allowed one to complement the other. That won't be allowable moving forward. And Annie, is this my hand? Uh, yeah, but um, we were going to start with the emergency access. Okay, just a good uh, overview.
Shared spaces have transformed San Francisco's streets and sidewalks. Local business communities are more resilient, and the neighborhood centers are more vibrant and lively. Sidewalks and parking lanes can be used for outdoor seating, dining, merchandising, and other community activities. We're counting on operators of shared spaces to ensure their sites are safe and accessible for all. When paramedics, firefighters, and other first responders arrive at a scene, they need clear visual access to see the building entrances, exits, and storefront windows from the street. That means park lit should be transferred in the areas above 42 inches above the sidewalk level. It's best if these areas are totally unobstructed, but transparent materials may be okay. You can check with fire department staff to make sure your site meets visibility requirements. Emergency response crews and their equipment also need to move easily between street, sidewalk, and buildings, especially when they are using medical gurneys, ladders, and other firefighting tools. <coughs> that means that parklet structures need a three foot wide emergency access gap every 20 feet, as well as a setback of three feet from the ends of marked parking spaces. Emergency access gaps need to be open to the sky without obstructions like canopies, roofs, or cables, and should always be clear of tables, chairs, planters, and other furnishings. Emergency responders need to use ladders to reach windows and roofs of buildings, and the ladders need unobstructed overhead clearance and room to be placed at a 72 degree angle against the building. Clearance is also needed around these ladders to move equipment and people safely up and down. So not all parklets can have roofs and canopies, depending on the width of the sidewalk in your area. Please make sure that your electrical cables are hung so that they're out of the way. And if strung from the building to the shared space structure, they can easily be pulled down by firefighters. Cable connections need to be powered from an outdoor rated receptacle in the building facade, because hardwired connections are much more difficult to disconnect quickly. <coughs> These updates to the Shared Spaces program will help to ensure safety and, um, and the victim in the video is, is my mother, top, top talent. Yeah, that gets into our technical manual, so don't worry about that. The only thing that you would probably pro probably have to worry about as a business owner is um, two things. If your sidewalk is less than 10 feet, then you can't have a roof. If your sidewalk is more than 10 feet, the only thing you probably want to consider is heaters. If you go towards propane heaters and you have a roof on your structure, you're not going to get a permit. So it's going to be one or the other. Um, other than that, you know, don't worry about the angles and stuff like that. It just has to do with our um, firefighting. And if the sidewalk is less than 10 feet, we just need to be able to put the foot of the ladder probably in the uh, your shared space structure so that we, if we're not climbing straight up. We kind of have a little angle because we're usually carrying equipment tools and stuff like that. When you say um, the definition of roof, are you saying just the overhang of the roof or are you talk, you're talking about the roof the whole entire roof? This, this, like, let's say this was a structure. This, anything above here that you're covering, that look is a roof. Oh wow! Yeah. So any, any kind of coverage at all. Um, even if you have just beams, slats across, anything like that, any kind of covering at all so, will not allow a permit for a propane heater. That last image there had an overhang with a heater, and then there was a heater that was allowed. When, when can you use it? When can you use a heater? Which image are you talking right about? Right here. See the it's green, and this one has an overhang with the heater, so you're not allowed that's, to do that. You're not that's allowed to do that. That's a dome, exactly. That's over the sidewalk, right? Or is that no. the whole, that's a whole structure? It, it, well, first of all, I have nothing over the curb line. So if this were the street and this is the curb, uh -huh. the structure is supposed to end at the curb line. Got it. So nothing goes over that. Are you allowed to have a heat on the sidewalk there? Next to the, next uh, to the curb line? Well, you'll have to talk to the other agencies because then that might get into obstructing clear path of travel. Because there's a distance that has to be maintained on the sidewalk, I believe. Is that? Six to eight feet. Six, Six to eight, eight feet. feet. And that variability is dependent on 
a few things. Partially, like if it's a high volume pedestrian zone, <clears throat> they're going to request that extra feet. An example would be like around Moscone Center when they know they have a conference, they're going to want the max allowable. And I will be forthright and candid in telling you that your options for heating are extremely limited. Um, I did some research this morning on battery <coughs> on battery heaters to see you know something that you could just bring in and out. But as Dennis indicated, you're not going to be able to have those the ADA cables or the across the sidewalk. And as Dennis pointed out, you know it's kind of binary. If you're going to do a heater like this, you know you won't have a roof. If you if you have the sidewalk space that allows for a roof, you know you're going to have to hedge that. But um, Again, for, for these are these are for various reasons. We don't we don't permit propane storage in the public right of way, so a lot of folks have like requested to storage tanks in their parklets, which isn't admissible, and um, it's it's a challenge to that extent. Can we put electric heaters? You go through the DVI. Yeah, electric heaters. Yeah, no electric electric heaters. So it's going to be dependent on a few things. If it's not hardwired, so the same way that you saw those string lights. Yeah. If there's a way that an electric heater is incorporated into that, you're meeting clearance within the parklet, and you're not running afoul of something else, it's not categorically impermissible. But but for what we're permitting, which is essentially open air outdoor occupancy, it, the lack of being able to build an enclosed roof and have heating inside it is something that's coveted that we don't allow. So even with uh, electric heater, no roof. With its potential, but we would need to we would need to see what it what it looks like because what Annie was alluding to, my colleague, we've had folks that have made have had questions about hardwiring things. Anytime you start talking about an alteration to the building or the public right of way, it's going to spiral into like you need a DBI permit, and we're not going to allow hardwiring under a sidewalk. Okay. Let's see if I'm clear. Yeah. No hardwire, just plug in. Correct. Wire above the uh, ten feet or higher. Ten yeah. feet or higher. Yeah. Electric heater under the roof of the parking. Yes or no? They make it like an infrared. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Categorically, like categorically, it's fine. Okay. Once it's in there, if I if I'm someone with the mobility issue, can I get in and out? You know, if you put the heater in and it blocks the accessibility, mm -hmm. you're trading no, one. The heater yeah. Yeah. They're, they're thin. thin. Yeah. They're really thin. They some come on a tripod. Yeah. And others you can just mount to. Yeah, yeah if that's, if that's, or if that's or yeah, like I said, it's not categorically against the combustible element. The roof, you know, it's two or three things working at once that present some challenges. That's what we have that. We have infrared heaters that we have on the roof that we did originally have with the ADA ramp over that yeah. our contractor once we know we can go through with ours, we are just going to do a plug. Cool. Yeah. How, are you, how are you liking them? Do you find that they work? <clears throat> But the they're, yeah, they're not as good as they're not as good as something that's gas powered. But yeah. we're not going to, like you said, there's there's other issues that go with that. They're they're as good as as we're going to get. Cool. Cool question. Yeah. So in my situation, I have a park with a canopy on the sidewalk that is less than ten feet wide. So I understand the canopy would have to come out. Mm -hmm. The structure that keeps. The metal sheet, also like these, will have to come out as well. The wooden. If it's over 10 feet, so the structure height cannot exceed 10 feet. And if you have muni lines, you have muni lines in front of your yeah. restaurant, yeah, then it's 10 feet. So anything above 10 feet will have to get adjusted. About 10 feet? <coughs> 10 feet high from the bottom all the way to the top. Okay. Yeah. So that doesn't matter then, it's the width or the size of it. For that well, wooden. the two things you should factor is first, how wide is the sidewalk? Yeah, yeah. less than ten feet. Less than ten feet, and so you cannot have a roof. I understand. Yeah, but the structure no and structure. Now, no structure open. Open has to be completely open. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no roof, no, no coverage. Nothing retractable. Correct. Uh, only nothing. Correct. No. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Permitted for a structure that is longer than 20 feet, um, you'll need a three foot access somewhere. Well, every 20 feet, you need it kind of in the middle. We'll allow for adjustments depending on what is there. So, a lot of places maybe have a parking meter or a tree or something. And if you put that three foot access, then it kind of is it's useless because there's an obstruction. So, if you need to shift it over a foot or, you know, just 
when you apply for your permanent application, you should submit a diagram, and everything should be on there and, and show how far you're going to shift it um, to avoid that obstruction. Then if you want to close it off, can't, cannot use chains and stuff like this. Simple beam, you have an image of that, yeah. uh, like this. Just something that we can, if we have to respond, and just one motion lift up and move aside. Um, and that's to give us access. And this is all part of the three foot access that we need. So this has to be clear all the way to the sky. So you walk through, no tables, chairs, no storage, 24 hours a day. Um, no no, no uh, roof and nothing in the middle. It just has to be clear. Are the barriers required? The barriers yes. are- I've had, I've had like four stolen. The barriers are required, it, it's also a safety element, right? No, I, I'm just saying, yeah. like, if they have to be removable at all times, I've had to replace them four times. So, I'm just, that's all, the only reason why I'm asking still. So yeah, yeah I, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, we, we just- What, oh, things being stolen in our city all the time? The, uh, yeah. the, the barriers are required because I think there's a notion that if you had a guest with a visual impairment or something to that effect, they want to keep you from wandering into an active Way. Or a child. So, sure. so yeah, yeah, a child. So the, the workaround is like you see some folks that instead of having a continuous parklet with the removable thing, they basically just have it completely two separate structures that yeah. are barrier. Um, but that's why that, that they're required the barriers. Oh, okay. So if you have like let, let's just say that that extends out like another wall towards you know perpendicular to the street. Would that be considered a barrier? So the two separate structures that you're just you're talking about? Yeah. So, I think what you just talked about. Yeah. Like so like so, so mine has a, like so if it's built out, it has like a bench that goes all the way around, and then a wall, and then the three foot gap, and then another wall, and then it goes all the way around. And the, in, the three foot gap is clear right now because I need to have a replacement beam for the one that's been stolen. Hit, hit me. I need a visual. I, need a I visual have a, like, a, look. I have a lot of. Just individual questions. Is there going to be time at the yeah, end that I can yeah. get them? All right. Yeah. So I'll just wait till that. Yeah, we're, we're. I mean, I think um, Sai has covered a lot of the of the fire. Um, but does anybody have other general fire questions? Just in that, just in that pathway there. Can you build like a gate, a small gate that would just open on hinges and would just swing back instead of having? No. 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 Yeah, be... it's it's really like the only option is this. Oh. Yeah. Well, the reason we have that is because people are very creative, all of you. People make modifications. So gates were put in, and then they didn't want access you know, after hours, so they put locks on oh, and latches eventually. And then it, it, it shuts off the access for us. So that's why it's just standard, uniform for everybody. This is it, simple operation. We throw the beam and go. If you have a propane heater permit, you will need a dedicated fire extinguisher outside. Last question. Yeah. Have you 20 feet and standing in three feet on each side of the clearance? Right? Yes. If I have the propane heater and I want to buy, I need a propane cage to put it outside. Can I attach that to the parklet or one of those three feet clearance? I, I, to my knowledge, I don't think the cages no. are going to be allowed. No, no, because it's next to combustible materials. So and where do you store the propane? Uh, you would need to take it with you at the end of so each day. Back, back where? Back to your house, or I'm not sure if there's another area. Well, I, I, I don't know where you're going to take it. <coughs> All I know is it is the only time I've seen storage for a, a, a restaurant is, for example, um, if you have a clear path of travel maybe to the back. Some restaurants, and I know it's not common, have like a tradesman's path maybe on the side that goes to a backyard. Like an alleyway? Uh, yeah, but it's gotta be uh, clear to the sky. I, I need to be able to walk through that when I, if we do the inspection for storage, I need to be able to walk through that pathway and see the sky the entire time opened up to an exterior area that you're gonna store it. So our, our, our thing is you have to have it stored outside, secured, well ventilated, not blocking any kind of egress, exit path, right? Um, away, at least 10 feet away from any kind of um, gas shutoff, anything like that, any utility shutoff, and away from main doors. And away from the parklet. Well, if the parklet's gonna be on the street, yeah, you can't store it on the street or the sidewalk. 
So if you're going to store it, it's got to be, as far as the fire code goes, the state fire code, outside, well ventilated, and secured. I so I just don't see any any extra that you could add. Yeah, that's, that's it not, it, yeah, it, it's hard. Storage is a problem. <laughs> um, that's what I said. Very, very few of them have access to a backyard that they can store there. And then even then, you know, it depends on the size of the yard. If it's if it's if that's an exit path for people to evacuate, you, you can't have it there. Uh, if it's too close to a gas shutoff, you can't have it there. I mean, there's there's things that you know you have to weigh for storage. Wow. So, so probably we won't see that many propane heater in the city at all. Possibly. I mean, according to these. Yeah. Okay. That sucks. In San Francisco, we need that. The heaters? All oh, year. Yeah, yeah. That, that's two of us markets. That's good. Oh, well, safety is important too. So I just want to back up Lieutenant Sai that there's a reason, safe. and he can tell you, share stories. And I know it's really hard, but he can share stories with you about why these rules are in no, place. Yeah, it's and, it just yeah. seems unreal. Though, it's hard. Well, to, to, to go back on some of this, before the pandemic, these heaters required a permit to operate uh, and have someone on site to check for leaks. Yeah, yeah, but so, the pandemic was a different world. Well, the, the, it was a different world, but the hazards still exist, and that's what we're, we're trying to balance. The compromise on this is we allow businesses, if they meet the, the minimum qualifications, and then they sign liability and accept it. However, because of safety, we can't just you know open it up. That that's the problem. Is is it's true that things were different pre-pandemic, but unfortunately the hazards that we face, the things that can happen. If you have time, YouTube just one of these tanks, one of these uh, blue rhino tanks, for example. Look at how much of an explosion one of those tanks takes out, and you'll understand how three to five to more of these tanks in one location can can be devastating. So. I know everybody thinks, what are the odds? When's the last time any of you had an explosion for propane? You're absolutely right. Everything is always fine. It's always all right until it's not. And so with our job, for fire especially, we look at everything worst case scenario. And so things we've seen or heard about is a lot of reasons why these safety things are here. It's, it's hard to understand. I know you guys are trying to get back up on your feet. Business is important, but we just have to weigh the safety too. <coughs> Anybody else? Yeah. And we can get into individual scenarios too during uh, Q&A when we do breakouts. Yeah. Um, so these are the different types of parklets. I just wanted to make everyone aware that there are options. Um, primarily, I know the audience <coughs> here today has a commercial parklet. Um, we all oftentimes get questions about securing your parklet overnight. So I just wanted to address that. Um, your parklet, if you are operating commercially, needs to be open between the hours of 7 a.m. and midnight. However, you are able to gate the parklet um, to secure it during off hours. Um, we recommend utilizing scissor gates as a good example. You just want to make sure that that three foot emergency access uh, gap is clear. Um, and I'd be happy to send you uh, photos of uh, parklets that have done this successfully, but that three-foot emergency access gap cannot be gated at any time um, for safety reasons. But another good option, um, it's a very affordable option, is a movable commercial parklet. Um, so that's one that you know can be built um, in the morning and then taken down during off hours um, and stored away. So wanted to make that an available option. And then a public parklet, you wouldn't be able to reserve um, seats for commercial use. However, we know a lot of businesses that share um, a public parklet on a block and will go get a coffee and you know different customers of these businesses are all sitting in there. It's just the seating cannot be reserved. Um, so public seating, also want to get ahead of um, the ABC proposed regulations. Um, it's something that we're looking into, we're tracking. Uh, public comment is closed at this time, but I know there's been concern about um, the ability to have public seating in certain parklets um, that are restricted for um, people over the age of 21 and what the implications 
mentioned, might be. Um, we'll certainly provide a programmatic update as soon as we hear um, of those regulations and the outcome. <coughs> Says the Coastal Portal shall provide a permit for the CA. Uh, yeah. So it's a 14 feet. One space is 14 feet. It's barely enough for four tables. Um, so it's going to be um, delineated by a sign, right? So it's a sign that's going to look like this that will be delivered to you once your permit has been approved. Um, this rule goes into effect in April. It is part of the legislative program. It's something that the Board of Supervisors wanted in the legislation because it, it harks back to what the parklet program was before the pandemic, which were all public parklets. So, so is that, that particular table or seating has to be dedicated and empty at all times during, either during business or it could be occupied by the... It has to be available at all times for public seating and the thinking, again, is more, it's, it's not, it doesn't have to be a table, but it does have to be a seat. A seat? Yes. Yes. My alternate public seating, is that if there's like a sidewalk bench that is nearby, is that an acceptable public seating area that does not have to be included in your park load? Good question. At this time, we are, didn't we get a question about this last week? At this time, we're asking people to have the public seating available in the interior of the park load. Yeah. I think the legislation, yeah, it's required for every 20 linear feet, um, and um, to put it within the envelope of the parklet, um, and it needs to be like like a bench big enough for like two people to sit down on. It's kind of a, it's, it's not specified in the exact amount of feet, but I forget what the dimensions are, but like. I mean, have you seen any proposals? I've, I've, I've had business owners ask me about this and the ability to create the flip down options so it's not interfering with the footprint of the interior of parklet um, so things like that like you can get creative so it's not taking up you know that space and just making like a flip down seat that could be an option yes. All right. and, and this has been passed and will be put into effect <coughs> in and you said April. yes this was passed um, was it by vote or was it um for the they legislated this aspect into the legislation. And again, this doesn't go into effect until April. Um, so really quick on drainage. Um, I know, Greg, do you want to handle these last few slides? Yeah. On so this has been one we've gotten a few questions on, uh, specifically regarding the 656. And the objective is to get that 36 uh, Square inches. So some curbs don't come up to, to six inches. So folks are just like, yeah, what? How, how do I build the, you know, upon something that exists? But the notion is that you're going to want to be able to um, get in there with a broomstick or something and get waste out. Um, we've seen ones where like, even though we're having a wetter winter this year than prior years, but honestly, a lot of the stuff that I'm seeing with drainage. It's not necessarily like there was a storm and it's floating away or it's like pooling and there's a river. It's also just like, we've seen some that are disgusting, that basically urban discharge pools proximate because there's nowhere for it to go. So when you think of water that has that rainbowy metallic finish to it, mixed with a little bit of like whatever else happens on the sidewalks, mixed with maybe a bus boy dumping something on the outside the parklet, it can become something where now it's like, I'm not talking to the hydraulic group about water draining, but like EPH might actually get involved because it's an unhealthy standard. So um, when in doubt, if our review team, if you were working through this and you have a question about the, the curb cut as it relates to that six inches, remember we're looking for the, th the 36 square inches. So if you can demonstrate that, you might even say assertively, we have a four foot tall curb, we've built it out for this part of ensure drainage. Uh, but that is something that when we do our inspections that they're going to look for. Uh, it will be helpful to our team if they are availed in advance that like the 36 inches are accounted for otherwise, because then we can we can try to proffer that information in the inspection. So if the height is not six inches, the curve. Yeah. Just let, just let us know. Four inches go out nine inches. Make up make up for so it by so going out. Yeah. Linear. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's, that's 
And then also in earnest, <clears throat> if somebody had to come out there to clear the site, to get garbage from under it, 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 it are they able to Can do that? Can you put a screen? Excuse me? Can you put a screen at the end of the uh, so the stuff doesn't come in just once? Would be much easier. To I don't know. That's, not, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Yeah. It doesn't have to be very flying screen. Well, there's, there's that option, but we've also, another like best practice that we've seen is like a flip down portion on a hinge where it goes to the sidewalk and it's flush with the sidewalk and then you can flip it up oh, okay, so to sweep out and power wash and sweep out. So with um, the curbs being very, very shitty, um, you know, the side is old, yeah. old uh, concrete stuff, um, having that drainage spot, like what I've been using is a, like a quarter inch steel, but it needs to sit on something like, can it touch the curb itself? I think it's okay if it touches the curb, but one thing that they're going to be pretty unequivocal about, I'll, I'll, I'm projecting the same adjective you just invoked without <laughs> saying it, but like those curbs, mm -hmm. you can imagine if you start bolting stuff to them, the structural oh, no, integrity diminishes. So, yeah, yeah, sitting yeah. sitting okay, bolting, affixing, never okay, triggers a different set of permits. Except for the soft post delineators. Except for soft posts. Which you have to bolt into the street. But so that's like, also the roadway, and yeah. the bolting threshold for a roadway and a sidewalk's a lot different. You can you can nail something into the roadway and it's going to break a lot less easily than the sidewalk. Also, I'll just be I'll be candid and telling you the sidewalk we're more uptight about because that represents a path of travel. We have a legal obligation to keep it clear. The roadway, whether you've got a food truck there, a car, or a parklet, we have a little bit more gravitas as to what we afford. But the sidewalk accessibility and safety is pretty absolute. Inspection will be stuck in way. Well, it depends. You know, we're responding to complaints on an ongoing basis, so that that constitutes inspection. We're going to be sending folks out to assist with the 10-day posting. So your notice of intent to apply, you know, that that's going to be an inspection. And then additionally, once you go through your 10-day post, once your site plans have been approved, um, we'll send someone out to do an inspection to ensure that it meets compliance. So one of the one of the th differences we have to split with this program, the old parklet program we required professionally engineered blueprints. Um, it would take a lot longer. Instead of a 10-day period, it was a 30-day notification. Now we only require consent if you're encroaching. Before, we required consent, even if it was contained within your own frontage. And <clears throat> one of the things is we required a lot more premeditation before. So when we went out to do a final inspection, it was a lot easier to pass folks. Now, because we're not requiring PD engineered blueprints, you basically have a checklist, yes, it's accessible. If our team goes out there to inspect, you may and, and you don't pass inspection, that's going to necessitate another round. So we're always welcome to have folks reaching out for clarity in advance because we don't want to waste our inspectors' time going out there. And we know that y'all are very eager to begin operating in, in these structures and also just to get it behind you so that you're on the annualized basis. So um, reach out to us. So there's what I'm getting at: three or four different points of inspection. They're all ongoing now. And one of the things that's going to trigger your inspection is have you submitted your application and have you followed up with the team. If you haven't submitted a legislated application, again, I'll be candid, you're behind the ball. you got to get one in, you got to get that going, it won't take care of itself. And it's going to have some unforeseen consequences if you don't take care of it because your permit's going to expire. And if you have an expired permit and you haven't submitted a legislated application to us, it gives a city like a, a different sense of liability than otherwise. Yeah. But the thing is, uh, till April 1st, Everything is stayed away days, right? It depends what's out there. Something now okay, constitutes. We haven't got notified or, or. But you're also don't yeah. leave yourself open for complaints, right? So yeah, that's yeah. what we're we're trying to protect you because the public. Can but with no complaint and nothing like that till April first, things can stay the way they are. Right? As long as it's not a life safety. But that also means like, that like April second it's gone. That's over the eight feet till ten feet, right? Yeah. So till April 1st, then the inspector comes before April 1st or after April 1st? Your permit's depends. expired, and if you don't have something yeah. street legal there on April 2nd, you're, you're, you're putting too much, many eggs in that April 1st basket, okay. because what that means is you're going to hit a point where you don't have a bridge to step on, let and you're going to fall in again. Let me go through this timeline. I think it will be Yeah, really timeline. Helpful. Just one second. Okay. So your applications are due January yeah. 15th if you already have it in. We, but I want to just say to the group, a lot of business owners will contact the shared spaces inbox and be like, 
I emailed Brian or Kelly and I'm waiting for the response and then I email Brian or Kelly or you know whoever's on the receiving end of the case management and they'll be like, yes, I sent them an email back for waiting for X, Y, and Z document right. six weeks ago and then the restaurant owner just like overlooked it. So just make keep your eyes on the inbox, yeah. just want to make sure. Um, so once everything's complete, everything's in, all your documents, your site plan has been approved, then they do the 10 day public close day. And then um, after that, your permit is gonna be conditionally approved. It's gonna be an element status um, based on the modifications that you're planning on making. Then means after you've completed the modifications, and I do encourage people to start, once your site plan has been approved, to start thinking about contacting the contractor soon because if everybody waits until the last minute, there's gonna, it's gonna be scarce. Um, so you're gonna make the modifications, and then um, then you get the inspection again. After the one Yes. And, and that's when you get your final permit. So this January 15th, April 1st is kind of a window to get your application approved, get the 10 day notice, make the changes, get the final inspection, having all that all lined up by April 1st. Is, um, so that's why like, you can't just do it all on April 1st. No, no, okay, I understand. Yeah, uh, I know this is separate, but do you know of a cafe tables and chairs permit deadline as well? It's the same. Yeah. Everything's the same. Great. Yeah, including the roadway. Um, so these are just some of the elements that are in the application itself. Um, if you guys have any questions about that, there's going to be an application and site plan workshop in early January, so we'll be promoting that. Um, this is a site plan template that we offer to businesses. It can be hand-drawn not have to be computer generated, but just make sure that you account for all the pieces of city architecture, so any manholes, any parking meters, or things like that, so that the review can be thorough in terms of what you're proposing. Um, neighbor consent as well. Um, if your parklet is encroaching on your neighbor's frontage, you want to be sure to get neighbor consent signed. I just want to do, do say, though, that the neighbor consent is only good for the duration of one year. So if a new tenant moves in, for example, I get this question a lot, let's say your neighbor's a commercial frontage, new tenant moves in, that neighbor moves out, the following year, if the new tenant doesn't want your parklet in front of their business, um, then they have the right to say no. Uh, yes, sir. If the, the neighbor no longer wishes <coughs> to use his parklet and look it down, it's on the side of his, it's not in front of his business, on the side of his business. Do I still need his consent? <coughs> this, Sorry, is, what was this? this is the front door. Mm -hmm. His yeah. front door. Let's say my business is here, and his apartment was here, mm -hmm. and he no longer wants it. Do I still need his consent? And it's the side of his building, not in front of his building. No, no, the, no. The, you're talking about consent for use. She's talking mm -hmm. about consent for encroachment. So yeah. no, you can't do what you're proposing because the, the outgoing businesses, the permittee, their insurance is covering it, yours isn't. Andy's referencing encroachment when you go beyond your own store frontage or beyond the parking space. So if something's three doors down from, or you know, around the corner, no, you would not be allowed to request consent. And I'll be candid, if it's there now, it's likely non-compliant, so it nece it's not necessarily worth, it, worth the docking. But when we, when we review the incoming applications, we're going to request to see a correlation between the address of the business and the frontage. Now we're going to seek substantiation with a consent letter for where it goes above and beyond. Okay. So is, is it the landlord of your neighbor that you're encroaching on that makes that decision, or the tenant that makes that decision that allows you to keep it or not keep it? It depends on the situation. So if there is a tenant, in, and it's, we're only talking about ground floor, we're not talking the ground about. Floor. Yeah, um, if there is a current tenant, it would be the tenant. So ground floor if it's garage, is that the landlord's decision then? Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you.